Hello and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us this week. I hope you're well. This week we have a pre-recorded episode of People of Science where we get to talk to people who work in science, they get to share their story, their STEM origin story, where they found the passion for what they do. And this week we have Bill Britton on and it was an absolute pleasure uh, having him on to talk about this topic that's going to engulf our entire month of August here, which is the future of space, to take a look at what are some things that are really going on. You know, the billionaire space race kind of kind of sucked a lot of the oxygen out of the air for the space industry, and it kind of, you know, got reduced down to, oh, there's just a bunch of billionaires launching into space. And it's that's only scratching the surface of what's to come. And in this episode, it's really focused on what is the... What is the workforce going to look like? What is access to space jobs look like for everybody? And we talk about the crossroads of cybersecurity and space. We get to talk about how this applies today, how you keep a spacecraft, uh, anything in space, secure on the Internet. And these these pillars, these three pillars that Bill is trying to help uh, teach the younger generation early so that... They become very competent space employees, space professionals that will have long-standing jobs throughout it because with how digitized our lives have gotten in the last year, you can only imagine where it's going to go. And in space, everything is digital. You going into space, they're gathering a ton of data. What do you do with that data? How do you make sure that it's the data that you think it is? And then how do you secure that in the end and understanding how it all works, and how to use it to your advantage to accomplish wild things, which you're going to be able to do thanks to the cross-section of cyber and space. So it's a really fascinating fascinating episode. Please lock in and get ready. We're going to learn a lot really quickly here and learn about CCI and the challenge that they have going to help invigorate this younger generation and teach them about those three pillars in a really fun and interesting way and we can't wait to learn you know see it happen in real life and see it happen it's it's really cool so without further ado welcome bill Britton on the podcast thank you for joining us this week before we go make sure to help as as you do always and we do appreciate it spread love and spread science so thank you for supporting us telling us what topics you like what you're looking for is huge subscribing to the podcast on wherever platform you are whether it's youtube or apple podcast spotify your favorite podcast player anywhere like that that's super helpful telling people about the podcast giving a review if there's a review for it literally sharing with friends and family that's a huge huge thing it gets us to create this amazing community that we have right now with today in space and what funds today in space is our 3D printing effort with AG3D, our lab where we bring ideas into reality with 3D printing. Uh, we've got a lot in the works, a lot of work that has been funding this podcast and our, our science efforts here uh, with the podcast. And it's not a lot of stuff we can talk about, but we are posting a lot of stuff online. So you can check us out at AG3D Printing. And if you have any projects that you want to bring into life with 3D printing, go to ag3d-printing.com, head there, see what the free quote process looks like, reach out with a project. We just had a few people do that in the last few weeks. We get started and we show you what we can do and help you bring a simple idea. It could be something that's just in your head, bring it into life and in your hands, use it and see if it's a good idea. You know, and then then you can see whether I'm going to invest in this full term. But at least you've been able to say, hey, is this possible? And then there's also fun stuff, right? There's fun stuff that you might just want to 3D print. Maybe you, you are aware of a place called Thingiverse, where all the free models are on the Internet. And then, you know, if there's anything that you want on there, that's also something we can help you do. If you design stuff, it's limitless. There's so much to do. And that magic that you get brings us magic to the podcast to let us do more things which you know the world is what it is and traveling is a little restricted but when we're first able uh funding this podcast helps us go to places like starbase in texas and down in florida in the space coast and wherever else is going to be rocket launches and and astronomy to be done uh, a little preview of the future but i'm going on way too long this episode's already an hour jam-packed with science thank you for joining us welcome bill Britton, and here's another segment of people of science enjoy
Welcome, everybody, to another segment of People of Science. This week, we are uh, checking out a little crossroad of the future space, potential future space economy. And this time, we're talking about space combined with cybersecurity. And uh, this week, I have the pleasure of having Bill Britton on the podcast today. Uh, and and Bill, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it off to you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, where your your passion in science came from, and, and what we're here to kind of talk about today. Uh, great questions. Um, so I am one of those successful converts. In, in other words, I went to a liberal arts college. I got a degree in social science and political science, went into the military into a highly technical arena. I went into electronic warfare. Uh, so I spent 10 years operationally flying on Air Force platforms. And then the last 10 years, I moved into the intelligence arena associated with space platforms and space systems. Um, it's really interesting because the more and the more that I did, the more in-depth technology-wise it got. And, and I started at a time where the technology in the individual case, that is the, the computer usage was not that advanced. So we went some from very, very big to ultra small computer technology. Uh, so it, it was just a fun time. And then after I retired from my 20 years in the Air Force, I went into the private sector, um, worked around the Beltway, uh, worked for all the three letter agencies around DC, the Department of Defense also, and then also uh, many of the services in the areas of information technology, space support, and cybersecurity. And so I, I've, I've kind of been in all those areas for the last, oh God, 35 years. Mm. So um, I've seen a significant amount of transition in that time frame, And then I ended up at Cal Poly um, University. Uh, and it's been amazing because as the CIO, I also work with all the technologies at the university. And we've created some really unique partnerships and fun experiences for the students to be able to take access to and really enjoy and go crazy with. I, I think that it's awesome, man. I, I'm really glad to talk to you today about this. Um, and your experience is so, you know, we we did this people of science segment to kind of show people that there's so many different ways of getting into this. And I think yeah. you, you have one of those experiences that I don't think many people think about as an avenue of getting into this um, or even kind of like uh, intersecting with it. Um, so we, we were talking just before the podcast about this, um, this intersection of cybersecurity and yeah. space. Now that all these things are kind of, these two industries are moving together and, and speeding forward. Um, and, and, and let's, let's set the scene for, for folks. Yeah. So I think what we've seen over time is, is that um, the world I worked in, you know, when I originally worked in it, the, the, a true story. So we were doing satellite mission plan and we used butcher block paper because it was miles long and we literally were doing the data doubt relays and connection points by drawing them on the butcher block paper, right? Wow. And then they would put that up on the wall and they would put a timeline on it and they would match that up to the mission planning. And then they would follow that butcher block and the timelines for the actual execution commands. Wow. Right. It was crazy. So yeah. one of the first things that we did was as so we knew that we needed to modernize, convert that. One of the things that they did, they did a relationship chart. Now, you know, you are using spider web and all these different relational charts. So back in those days, they didn't have all that stuff. So you know what they used? There was no computer. They used twine, yarn and pin cushions in the wall. Wow. And they would take these areas and they'd say, you know, here's a command segment. And they would tie that command segment to other segments. And they took the yarn and they would string it from that segment with the pin and put it into the other one. And so when you were done, there was this huge, this huge room full of yarn and pin cushions that was doing the relationship alignments for decision points and other things. It was the weirdest looking thing you ever yeah. saw. <laughs> right? but so, so we've advanced a little bit from there. The advancement we've seen is something we all take for granted. We don't really we don't acknowledge, but it's really digitalization, right? It's the mm -hmm. digital environment that we live in. So we've seen things from like, um, even in our home usage, right? We've seen digital go from playing board games to now video games, mm -hmm. right? Same effect. What used to be the family got around. I actually had a situation the other day where my wife took my son's uh, VR kit and is playing go fish with it, you know, and it's a family wow. argument to get the VR set back, right? <laughs> 
So it's like, it's really, it's amazing to watch. So again, that, that digitalization has really become imperative. Now, if you think about space and cyber, digitalization in space is everywhere. The space force that I was in was very analog related. It was point to point relays. It was connection points, it's hard wiring. Mm. That's all digital now, right? So, so that, that modern person working in space, that modern employee, modern rocket scientist, all of them have to be digitally literate. Mm. They have to understand what it means to be digital. In other words, if I make a change in my architecture with a digital architecture, I not only change the one node, I change all of them. Mm. Because digitally now it reaches so many different directions at one time, right? Mm. So what I see is really three pillars, three, three knowledge points that we have to start addressing uh, or competencies on a much deeper scale. So the first one is digital, digital literacy. The second is, is that digital creates an awful lot of data, right? Mm. So if you think about it in space, um, a digital relay, the relay itself, that's the time from, from point A to point B is measurable. The effect on that time is measurable. The strength of that signal is measurable. So again, what I'm doing is I'm creating this picture of all this data now that is measurable and available to you in that digital environment. Mm-hmm. Things we never thought were, were measurable, things we never thought were able to be analyzed can now be analyzed, right? Mm-hmm. So everybody's going crazy, digital analytics, digital analytics. Well, really what it is, to me, it boils down to understanding the compute capability necessary to do all that analysis. So really, if you will, the second component is cloud analytics, understanding the cloud, how to use the cloud so that you can do all of this amazing mm-hmm. data analysis, Right. Right. So when you have digital uh, awareness and you have cloud awareness, you now have a third component that's required because each digital and cloud creates security concerns by amassing all that data, protecting the data. It may be proprietary. It may be classified. All these different components that now cybersecurity is an important component tied to digital, tied to cloud. Now, so here's the challenge. Do I have to be a PhD in those all, all those areas for the future? Mm. Because the that's how it's no. been. Well, the answer is yeah. no, right? Yeah, like that's yeah. how it's been traditionally. Is, exactly. I, I can't. I, my, me myself, I, I followed that path, and um, I, so many people from from even before that. I mean, you're talking three, four degrees before you were really right. working on anything. Absolutely. Yeah. So now, if you think about it, you know, again. Um, a lot of that was because you had to specialize, right? You had yeah. to get really, really specialized to get to that next level of understanding. But if you're looking at it now, that digital makes you more aware than you ever thought before. Mm. In order, it, so in, in other words, you don't have to specialize. What you become is an expert in understanding how to get to the data, how to yeah. get to the information. Then with the cloud, how to process that information and how to use it. And with the cyber, how to protect it. How to ensure it's real. So so again, uh, garbage in, garbage out. I'm sure you've heard that when it comes to data. So how do you make sure that the data you're collecting and putting in there isn't false or Mm -hmm. isn't from a place that somebody gave you just to create a false response? Right. And is this, could you relate this to folks that aren't, there are a lot of people that listen to the podcast that aren't deep into space, which I think is the the audience we're looking for here. Uh, That that could be pretty relatable to what we're seeing in everyday life with all the Absolutely. phishing scams and all that Absolutely. stuff. Like it, it could take a completely different form in space and every piece of data, whether it's telemetry or, or anything else that could involve with your, your actual life in orbit yeah. or whatever you're doing, like that needs to be the thing that you know right. what it is. Yeah. So, you know, we, um, uh, you know, I lived through the, the world of uh, developing cyber cybersecurity as it evolved over time. And what we see is this massive shortfall in cybersecurity professionals. Mm. Right now, the list is like 645,000 uh, shortage people, right? So we're missing 645,000. Wow. And, and part of that was because we, nev- we haven't evolved to where we really understand who to produce, how to produce, where they need to go, how they need to get there, and the mm. levels of experience. Mm. And w- what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is these competencies can be created earlier on in life in a much easier platform delivery and so that the experts we need for the next generation space support mm. can actually start getting there now. Um, we're targeting as early as middle school for some of this, that there's no reason in middle school you can't learn about digital 
right? You know all about mobile. There's no reason you can't learn about cloud and there's no reason you can't learn about cyber enough to be participatory to the point where you're helping to manage, run that future environment. Right. And I, and I think most kids by that age uh, have experienced the first two at the very least. Right? Absolutely. Um, so the, the security aspect, that that just becomes like a, a, a thing you learn growing up, just like you would, you know, keep anything else you have on you safe, you know? Uh, well, again, you know, it's it's really interesting. Um, it's not that we've made it too hard on purpose, but we've made mm -hmm. it hard because of what it took to get here. But if, uh, if again, you know, the, the image I have, uh, it's a great one, you know, um, You've got the, the conversation that says the uh, compute size necessary to support putting men on the moon was this massive control room at Houston Center and two other rooms full of computers, right? Mm -hmm. That compute power fits on your telephone now, and it's 10 times greater than that mass computer. Yep. So you want to talk about digital awareness? <laughs> you have it all in your hand now. Yeah. I mean, think about that. It's that, You know... Uh, uh, my teenager, 17 years old, he can, he's, he's got VR, he's got his telephone, he's, he's got more compute knowledge than it took me to understand all the way up until, you know, my mid thirties when we were moving you know, into Unix, right? Sure. So again, that, that digital awareness is there. Now, hmm. combine that with understanding the cloud or the analytics side of things. Hmm. How do I dissect the data that I have in front of me? How do I get it all there? What does it mean to me? Um, again, the choices that we make in life, right? If you look up something on the internet and you say, you know, I want to know more about raising tomatoes, right? Mm. And and how many of the articles you read are, are real or, or, or BS or, you know, whatever. So you have to decide, you have to decipher, right? So you're, yeah. you're, you're utilizing in your head this deciphering code of what's real and what to accept. You're not going to be able to keep up with that in the future, particularly in space with all the data and digital information. And, and I completely agree. And it's a, it's like a growing problem. Like even in the last, it was accelerating the last five years. And then in this last year, the amount of data output that we, and input that we have to handle every day. I mean, the, what the truth is, is sliding around like a, like a piece of Absolutely. ice on the ground. It's crazy. And, and, and so here's again, the classic response, the, the old school. And I can say that because I was the old school response is go get a computer and sit down and figure out an algorithm that would provide you that answer. And that mm. would take you weeks to do. Right. Now with cloud, you don't have to do that. As a matter of fact, mm. we have this platform at the university that we ran. And we, we run 65,000 inputs simultaneously. And each input has about 225 variants. So basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out uh, w which of those inputs is acceptable for the variant selection, right? Okay. Um, and so the key is you can adjust the variants based on certain qualification points. That whole process utilizing normal compute power and servers, and that was using three to four servers, that took us usually about three weeks to complete. Wow. We put that in the cloud, we, we, we digitized it, we, we brought it down into a cloud environment, we can run that now in 15 minutes. Wow. Right? And if you want to run multiple iterations of it, mm. we can run them in parallel, same 15 minutes. That's wild. I mean, so the thing that's run through my head is, as far as a, like a, an application in space is the, 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 obvious, the obvious limit of mass, launching anything up there, right? Sure. And, and having to bring computers on board with you to be able to process exactly. that information is impossible. It's Exactly. It's not part of the equation. So this, this cloud access and being able to Bingo. do that, I mean, you can do uh, a approach simulation on the way to the spacecraft. You Absolutely. know, it, it makes sure your approach is correct and, and have redundancies in the data processing. Absolutely. To, to include then variations as you launch the vehicle. Mm. Right? So you can take data weather, you can take your relay information, you can take information that's non-traditional for use and put that into your data pool. And now you're looking at different perturbations going on around the space guy. winds, wow. altitude, weather, um, radio frequencies, uh, ultraviolet, you know, all yeah. these things can be put into that equation, be added in and additive to the data you're assessing around your platform. Hmm. So, you know, the, the big one I, I talk about, um, uh, uh, several good friends of mine are in the space elevator world, right? Mm, yes. And so, you know, imagine now you're, 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 you're thinking about a tether from here to outer space. Yeah. What happens if something cuts that tether, right? It's right. a bad day, right? Mm -hmm. So again, what you're looking at is the, the orbitology of all the different 
things flying around in space. Mm. So how much data is that, right? right? Well, it's 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 gigabytes, it's terabytes of information that you're coalescing that's worried about that one thin strand of data. So again, mm. utilizing cloud allows you to focus solely on that data set with all these different inputs. Mm. So, so cloud utilization is just in its infancy. I, I mean, we're, we are in, we're in um, diaper stage yeah. when, when dealing with cloud and understanding the potential for it to provide us answers. Now, again, right. the cool part is all of that training in cloud, all of that is accessible to even high school today. Yeah. Right. So then you add cyber on top of that. You look at what's going on in cyber and space. And so at the university, we started looking into, you know, is, is there an issue? Is there a cyber problem in space? Mm -hmm. And so we went to some uh, professional hackers, you know, we went, we went to Black Hat and we asked a couple of the goons. And I know you're familiar with the goon term, but, you know, the goon, for those who don't know, a goon is a hacker who is very revered in the, in the world of hackers and is actually allowed to be one of the overseers of Black Hat. In other words, they keep people in line. They don't let you break the rules. And they are usually the most knowledgeable hackers in those areas. Mm. So we went talked to a couple of the experts and asked them about space. And they said, um, it's an absolute crapshoot for space and cybersecurity right now. Mm. So you have all of these systems were designed and built, many of them analog, where there's no cyber protection built into them at all. Right. It's right. completely open. And they're using an analog RF relay system to do command and control. Wow. Right. They're hardwired. Right. So, so that, um, you know, if you were to say to a, a hacker on the, on the state side, on the ground side, Hey, uh, you know, I've got this hardwired old analog system. Do you think it's uh, vulnerable? Uh, after they pick them off the floor from laughing so hard, they're going to tell you, you got a problem. Well, that's where we're at with some of these older space systems. Mm -hmm. Then the next question is, as we're moving from analog and we're modernizing to digital, is security part of the posture you're designing into your spacecraft? Mm -hmm. Is it part of the way of thinking about engineering to support and design for the future? Mm -hmm. And then and we talk about things like multi-mission platforms where many different nations are working collectively. Well, what's their security posture when they put their systems together? Mm -hmm. Right. So the potential for a cyber person in space. So, you know, that number I gave you earlier, 645,000, mm -hmm. that's not including space. Wow. They haven't even looked at including that into that number. It's so, it's so early in the, in this process of this new it. era that's about to, yeah. I mean, it's, it's exploding uh, and it's, it's either going to get the support it needs from uh, the workforce or it's going to fizzle out if it doesn't get it. Yeah, it was, it's going to have to do something, right? I mean, yeah. it's just not going to sit there and wait. And, and what we see is that um, some of the space systems are using what they call proprietary security solutions. Mm. The key becomes, are they good enough? Right. And, and oh, by the way, if you're putting human life on those platforms, do you trust it? Right. right? Wow. So, so again, you know, I'm not saying th the sky is falling. I no. I'm just saying if we know there's a shortage for cyber professionals already, when we start adding space to the equation and the fact that it's moving digital and it's moving to a more, uh, you know, absolutely exploding analysis arena and data analysis arena, mm. where's the security and all of that? So I really think you have to be, to be successful future, you have to have all three of those components in your toolkit. You have to be able to be cognizant in all three things. Mm. But that also says I don't have to be a rocket scientist PhD anymore. Right. I can be cognizant, I can be relative in those three areas and be as successful working those space systems for the future mm -hmm. as I was in the past. Because, in, in again, in the past, as we were engineering, we were engineering the compute and the solution simultaneously. So we were building computers to, to do that mission and function. Right. Now, we're not having to build that, right? Right. It's all really there. So, so we have a, we work a lot with the cloud, particularly with Amazon Web Services. And we have an expression that we use. It used to be um, the art of the possible. I'm sure you've heard that before. It's the art of the possible, mm -hmm. you know. So if we can build it and we can give it the compute power it needs, we can do this. Mm -hmm. it's, that's not the condition any longer. It's the art of the knowledgeable. The mm -hmm. compute power is there. 
It's you figuring out how to use it to do that function and mission that you're using and protect right. it as you do. Hmm. So it's kind of a huge twist. Yeah, it is. And it's, in, it's an interesting problem too. You know, you're talking about the workforce and, and getting people involved early in this to not only redefine, you know, a, a standard in the industry, which is you need to be the expert of the expert of the expert. Right. Um, I, I saw the same thing. I was lucky enough to work uh, for an injection molding shop in Connecticut um, that was dealing with the same problem. They were getting involved with politicians down there because their tool makers were retirement age and yep. they, you know, th that knowledge was going to disappear and it was going to go away. And they, they wanted to get the kids in early and going to a trade school is not a popular thing to do. How do you change that and get people Absolutely. going? Um, so, so let's talk about that. Let's talk yeah. about the, um, what you guys are doing for that. Well, it, we have stumbled into one of the coolest things ever, and I've done a lot of cool things. I mean, I, I'm very, very fortunate. I'm very lucky. I've done some amazing things that just, you know, uh, you go back and you look at it, you go, holy crap, how did I get involved in that? Mm. What I'm doing right now is in that category of holy crap. So, so we started about five years ago doing for the state of California, a cybersecurity competition. Mm. So the college students built a competition that the high school students and middle school students participated in. And, huh. and we did it as uh, experiential. And in, in other words, we literally built sets. The sets contain, contained, uh, it was like going through um, a, a, a city. So the first year we did it, we had uh, a water table, you know, a lake that was poisoned uh, and the guy poisoned it, ju jumped in his car and was trying to get away and ran out of gas. So we built the lake. We built, we got the cars. Uh, we built the apartment where the dude lived and we built a scenario that the students followed through. So it's like okay. electronic clue, except you're really playing it yourself as a student and you, as a team. Right? Ah, this is so, amazing. So you went, you went up to the car and you did basically a search and seizure on the car and you looked for digital and physical evidence about who this guy was, mm. right? Um, and we had, we had 16 teams and we had 16 cars and uh, we had digital stuff. Like we had, um, we had a thumb drive in the car and a couple <laughs> other things, which led to the guy's email account, which then led to another ledger. And so again, it was just this built upon, built upon, um, the apartment was pretty cool because we hid stuff all around the apartment and you were, you were given a, a, a subpoena to go to his apartment and you went in and you looked for information or you looked for things that could help you. Like, so we had a picture on the wall that behind it, you yeah, had a thumb drive in the picture. And so again, you know, we were able to do all this uh, forensics analysis of all yeah. the stuff we found out and the kids basically figured out who done it and why and how. Wow. Right. So that was kind of cool. So we transitioned uh, over time. Uh, the next two years was on a, a medical device. That got scary, uh, but it was about a medical device, uh, a, a pacemaker uh, mm -hmm. that had malware implanted in it purposely. Uh, and they were doing ransomware on the malware of the pacemaker. So wow. that's enough to roll your socks down, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so last year, uh, I'm sorry, two years ago, the scenario that we were gonna do um, was we wanted to really leap out and we had been doing our research and this is where we started talking to our space experts about, you know, cybersecurity in space. Mm. And what we decided to do for the scenario was to have a spacecraft that was hacked, malware was planted on the spacecraft and it was forced to re-enter. Uh, and so basically wow. it was forced to deorbit. It came back to the ground um, in the magic of, since we're near Hollywood, it survived the crash and we had enough of the payload that we were able to do forensics analysis on the payload. Wow. So right in the middle of getting ready for the competition, COVID hit. So we had to take the entire competition and instead of it being experiential, we made it virtual. Wow. So That's we shifted. project. That's amazing. It, it was, it was huge. We, we shifted to virtual and we found a gold mine of opportunity mm -hmm. because what we were able to do was to really make it virtual enough that you were using the live tools and we built a cyber range to do it with. So you were using things like autopsy and Wireshark to do the forensic analysis on the payload. And th these are tools that you use in the real world to do those same functions. And so right. these teams of students were actually doing analysis 
on um, a payload part from a spacecraft. And what they found was some malware that had been planted. And the cool part is, so our, our, our students at the university build these scenarios, mm. but they have tech teams. The tech teams are experts from the industry that work with them to build it. And, and our whole goal is to create an environment that's really challenging, but it's as near real world as possible. Yep. And we have middle school and high school in the challenge competing to figure out the whodunit. Right. Right. So, so when people say, oh, this is too hard to do, I'm telling you, we have middle schoolers achieving success in this. Yeah. Right. And what we do is we prepare them for the competition by teaching them the components of, you might have heard this before, digital literacy, cloud analytics, and then cybersecurity, particularly forensics and analysis and networking analysis. Mm. So it's all those things we talked about and we put it into this game. Mm. Right. So last year we had over 500 high school, middle schoolers participate simultaneously. Right. So it, it was amazing. It was started Friday and went to Sunday. And the reason we were able to do this is because we ran it up in an AWS platform. And basically we used um, a gaming platform in AWS. So we were communicating with each other just like in a game in the world, right? Wow, oh, that's, and, that's and, there. And so the oh. students are, are co-talking, and you know, they're, they're chipping at each other in this yeah. language that I'm still trying to figure out, but you know, they're chipping at each other <laughs> and they're giving hints and working with each other um, and they're solving all of these elements, right? And right. so we tied, we tied the whole game around this thing called the, the NICE framework, which is the National Standards for Cyber Education. Hmm. And, and so by tying it to the frame, every, every part of the game that you completed equated to one of this nice framework equation. So there is a direct correlation to everything you achieve to something you're supposed to learn to be in cybersecurity, right? right? So at the end of that, we were able to give some digital badges. The key becomes, one, identifying for students. And I'll tell you, you wouldn't believe how many of them said to us, I never realized cyber was in space. Hmm. I never, never put it together. Yeah. The second thing they saw was I can do this and it's pretty cool and I want to do more of this. Mm. Right. Matter of fact, many of them said, can we keep playing the game? We said, no, nah, man, we got to we got to catch <laughs> off. You know? Somebody's got to win. And so we just stop it at a certain point And that's where it's at. Wow. But the, the real key was getting them motivated. Right. Right. Show them that there's this thing, these three attributes, you know, this this digital literacy, this cloud literacy and this cyber literacy. They're career fields you never thought possible. Mm. So we're going to do it again. Uh, we've got this uh, another challenge coming up in October for the high schools. And this is primarily focused in California. But in April of 22, we're calling it the Space Grand Challenge. Mm. And it's going to go international. That's we've awesome. got six states participating and two um, international uh, countries, uh, teams participating. Um, what will be cool about it not only will it be, you know, this virtual game, but we're also adding an esports flex to it, utilizing a Twitch account, nice. and we'll have running esport commentary as we go. Oh, that's amazing. Right? I, I think this is so exciting. I, I just have to say, like, it's so difficult to get people into science, especially something so theoretical and complex. Right. And just doing something that would actually apply to the job that they're going to have, like adding context to this is the career. Yep. This is what you could do. That doesn't get done enough in Bingo. STEM field. So this is, I'm blown away. I'm jealous, but I'm blown away. This is, <laughs> it, 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 uh, you know, the whole, the, the, the whole Twitch thing, you know, it's like, we have, we have our own, we're going to have our own Twitch channel. We're working with the Twitch people. And th th this is just amazing, the combination of things. Now, what's really cool, as you go through this thing, it's tied to the learning objectives of the national. I mean, you're when you get done, you're going to be able to say, I know how to do that. I know how to do that. I know how to do that. You, you can put this on your resume. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You've had suit. fun. Yeah. You've had fun. Right. You got so addicted to this. It was so much fun. You wanted to keep going and it's on your resume. I, I right. can't amazing so it um you know and, and then you're going to be competing with the australians you know i right. mean like, it, it's going to be international in nature now the, the other thing that we've done is is that we we said you know we we know we were getting to the high schools that had 
really strong STEM programs. Mm. And, and so what we wanted to do is we also wanted to get to those who don't have that or, or they're underrepresented and they don't right. have the connectivity that we have. So we've created a program called Cyber to Schools. And what we do is we basically help that school create, we refer to it as an innovation club. We, we don't want to, we, we didn't want to put one of the specific three components as the, the name. So, so we really put it about innovation, right? Mm. The idea of the innovation is, is that we provide the, the lecture material, the training material, the educational material that goes to support development of a team to compete. Oh, nice. And so we'll work with that high school, middle school, and we'll also find them an industry partner that will work with them. So they'll provide the technical expertise. So where most of the schools who don't have a, a, a tech teacher, right? Mm -hmm. We're providing, all they have to do is provide a club advisor, right. a faculty, right. and then we'll provide the tech and the curriculum mm -hmm. and we'll get them ready to compete in the competition. So they'll be competing in the Space Grand Challenge. Awesome. Uh, how, how do folks, especially in these areas where they don't have these programs, how, where, how do they get in touch? Yeah, so that, like that's, that? that's what we're starting now. We're in the pilot yeah. areas of those. Where we've got two specific unique school systems. I don't want to shout them out or, sure. or call them out without you know, their, their knowledge and approval. But, <laughs> but <laughs> once this is proven out on the April condition, um, our intention is to go nationwide with this thing. There, there will be no holds barred on this. Mm, I've and so to me, it. Yeah. It, it's a community response, right? Mm -hmm. This is finding a company in your localized area that is doing something and they're all over and yeah. getting the play with you in that capacity. And so, you know, what is it? It's, it's an hour a week commitment. The rest of it is on, Great. on the, on the kids. Yeah. And we've made it by utilizing AWS. We've made it as simple as, uh, we're, we're using an app stream. You don't, you're not downloading any software. Mm. You can, you can do this from a Chromebook. You can take your Chromebook and log right. in and you're running this high end game. That's awesome. So um, we're just super stoked about it. And then to add the international flavor and th there's just, there's a whole lot more we want to come back and talk about when we, we launch the, the notification with this thing. But um, you know what I'm excited about? So I, I, I'm excited about seeing all these kids who the light bulb goes off and goes, you know what? I got a chance and, and not just the kids, but community college grads or, or yeah. people in community college for them to know that they can be involved in the space race, the space environment, because they've got those competencies and skill sets and how to use them. It is the next gen workforce. I agree. And with everything that's going on with, you know, uh, this last year, you know, there was a lot of uh, concern about automation taking away jobs sure. and then everything that happened last year and jobs being lost. Like you got to wonder where, where do people move? I guess you can think of it like in the Star Trek sense where maybe one day we move to a place where everyone just works in themselves, but well, you know, that's, that, that's, you know. that's the beauty of this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> it becomes transportable. As long as you understand digital literacy, cloud literacy and cyber, you mm -hmm. can move to any of those areas because those are the workers that will be executing those skills. Right. right? Automations right. can only do so much. It still mm -hmm. needs to be programmed. It still needs to be checked. It still Thank needs to you. be validated. Yep. Right. That yep. will never stop. Mm -hmm. and, and even if the system is a self-learning system, who's making sure it's self-learning is correct. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Right? So, yep. so again, to me, these attributes, these competencies become critical, no matter who's running, somebody still got to push a button. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think again, for the space side, so here, here's the part that's going to be interesting. So let's say you go to outer space, right? And you're living on the moon. Ooh, man, we're living on the moon. Who's going to cut your hair? Are you going to, you know, you're going to trust a, an AI Floby? Right. I mean, you know, the key becomes it, it, you're not going to be a single functional person in that moon station. You're going to have multiple jobs and multiple roles. Mm -hmm. Some are manually oriented and manually intensive, but mm -hmm. others will be all of this data assessment, systems assessment, computers assessment, security, all those elements. Again, back to the three companies. If you've got a, if you've got a control of those three things, you become multidimensional in the areas you can support future. Mm. 
Yeah. And this, you know, it's skills just like, you know, being able to read and, you know, with, with how yeah. everything is advancing, it's yeah. going to become something yeah. kids are going to pick up just because the world is so cross-linked with digital. And yeah, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. So, I, you know, the way I look at it is, is um, one of my goals is to challenge the current system that um, do we need rocket scientists future to run and, and power and functionally execute the missions. Mm. You know, um, you, if you look at it, um, they are doing things like uh, communitizing space command and control. You know, AWS has put out a, a, a cloud-based command and control system for spacecraft design and support, command and control. So who's going to run that? Well, I would argue you, you no longer need a rocket scientist, chief engineer, but someone who is cognizant in digital literacy, cloud literacy, and cyber <laughs> to run those systems. And I don't need a PhD or a master's to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, at the same time that we're increasing the potential work, we're also decreasing the educational requirement, which now addresses a lot of the 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 students out there who don't want to go to college because they learn that they can learn just as much at home. So why not accelerate that pace? Yep. Yep. And I mean, you know, the, the traditional thing of college originally, if I'm not mistaken, was to train people for the job. And if we've gotten to the point where you can train yourself and, it, you know, it's, it's only a, maybe a two year associate's degree or maybe even less. Yeah, like what? I would argue that, you know, that college is still necessary for different mm -hmm. things, different uh, maturation, um, leadership functions mm -hmm. and roles, you know, other things. So college absolutely is still necessary, same as university and research and PhDs and everything else. What we're adding is another dimension to that whole equation. It's not replacing, right. it's right. adding to it because we're not keeping up with the sustained numbers needed to support the jobs now. How mm -hmm. are we going to keep it in the future? Well, the answer is we really accelerate what that two-year or even non-learner is ca capable of providing and doing. Yeah, it, it opening up the access to- Absolutely. Space. Yeah, and cyber. Yeah, no, this is, uh, that's a lot. It's crazy. I mean, it's so it's so good to have someone like yourself and, and your team behind this doing this and growing this uh, just fun experience that also teaches people things that are legitimately- uh, you know, the certifications people are looking for, the, the education yeah, it, people are looking for, the skills. It, it's, it's really exciting because um, we, we, we sit back nervously, but we sit back and we let the college kids, college students, run the game. Right. So, you right. know, the, the whole Twitch e-system, we're going to have an announcer 24-7 during the game. That's great. And it's a bunch of the college students who are, you know, big into esports and, they're going to be calling the, the game and, you know, checking in on each team. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah. No, it, it ties into the, the demographic of people, human beings that you're trying to tap into. It's right. using their, like, it's such a cool place to be where before it was so, it was still advancing, but it just wasn't something everybody knew about. And now it's at this new place, esports. You've got the total interest in space and just pop right. culture right now. All these things are lining up, um, everyone getting thrown on their phones for a year, even more than they already were. Like all of these things lining up is, uh, it's, it's, this is perfect for this type of thing. Um, so uh, let's, yeah. I mean, is there anything else? I mean, this has been amazing so far. I, I'd love to touch on anything else you wanted to, uh, to talk about. We've got probably another 15 minutes. I think I don't want to take too much of your time. No, um, to me, um, the fun part of this is that this is repeatable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, what we're trying to do is to establish the, the process, the methodology uh, validated. One of the areas that we're working on right now that's going to be really unique um, and we're, we're working on some really specialized assessments, but um, we're looking at because, you know, we're tied to a university and we have a bunch of these PhDs hanging around, you know, uh, <laughs> but we're looking at research into the effectiveness of learning under esports. Uh, how mm -hmm. much does it, how faster is it? Uh, the, the other one is the duration of learning versus retainment, mm. all these different categories that nobody's looked at before when it, it comes to learning in this capacity. So not mm. only is it really new, the way approach, but now we're trying to document it 
So we've got some statistical data that goes with it. Also to include then what we would call like a first learning experience where you've really never had a STEM program before. Does this accelerate your understanding knowledge in that STEM arena as a result of, you know, piquing your interest this way by the traditional uh, book and video format? So again, there, there's a lot of measurable data here that we're going to be able to look at and, and evaluate and, and really understand that allows us to change the game even more and be more advanced and more critical for the future. Yeah. And be able to deploy these programs out there. I mean, to training, training in complex topics. I mean, that's, that's what I get paid to do more or less for my day-to-day job and uh, using three printing technology and, and keeping those people successful on a daily basis, troubleshooting and stuff like that. Um, that this the whole aspect of, of what's to come is, um, is very exciting. And I, yeah, so, def- so, you know, th- this is really clearly, yeah. I, um, I have a personal pet peeve against fish me type accounts, you know, where they, mm. not, not the company, but the, the way that this whole process works is we're going to, we're going to send fake phishing attacks at you and then you learn from it. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I love the context when it originally started. It's awesome. But, but now I think we have to advance beyond that. We've got to find a way to be more realistic and, th- and they're getting, the companies are getting better, but so is the hacker at creating the scenario, right. right? Yep. So how do we defeat that? How do we get them to stop doing that short of cutting off their email, right? Mm. I mean, you can't do that. Right. So, so again, I think the key becomes embedding into the younger generation, the f- effects of phishing attacks mm. through gaming that, that programs are mine not to click. Because if you think about it right now, we're programmed to click. Yeah. And I want to I throw this out. Again, the reason Fish Me and other companies are doing great, because we as citizens are programmed to click. When your phone rings, what do you do? Do you, look you answer it? it. You answer it, yeah. Yeah. When you look at your cell phone now, if you, if you know who it is, you answer. It. Mm. If it's a number you're not sure of, you answer it, even though you know it's going to be a telemarketer, and then you push, <laughs> you know, hang up. Right. So, right. so again, we are programmed. We are pre-programmed to push the button. Mm. How do we unprogram ourselves to push the, the read? And sure, so again, yeah. That's the question. And I think gaming mm. is the way to get there. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the you're talking about behaviors, right? Yeah, Setting up absolutely. behaviors. And, and uh, the technology we have is, has set us in these behaviors of clicking and opening and all that stuff. And yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, again, companies that are doing this in the fishing arena and fishing education, they're getting there. They're, they're learning that they've got to be faster, more robust and all these mm-hmm. sorts of things. And that the old school philosophy of penalization as a result of failure, that's not working. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to the penalty box because you push the button. That, right. that doesn't reinforce good behavior. Yeah. All that does is reinforce negativity on the part of the employee. Mm-hmm. So again, the gaming atmosphere, gaining credits, points, that are, again, changing up the format. Yeah. No, and I'm glad to see it's had so much effect. And I'm really looking forward to this going uh, internationally for you guys. This yeah. is this is very exciting. Um, what, what else can you tell us about what Cal Poly is doing in like different ways that folks who are outside of the college arena now in the workforce, getting themselves in and in, involved. So um, one of the other things that um, the, the Cyber Institute, uh, that, which is a part of the university, an extension of the university has done, is they've gone into extended training. This is like extended education type activities mm-hmm. for these non-degree areas. So we don't, we don't do the academics. What we're providing is certification training, mm-hmm. extension training, um, repurpose training. So um, we have focused our opportunities in this training around the three pillars, which is the digital literacy, which is cloud literacy and cybersecurity. So we're offering that for uh, reemployment opportunities, for cross-training opportunities, for even enhancement in your own areas. So we work with everyone. Uh, we work with law enforcement. We work with other government agencies to really provide these experiential opportunities, a learn by doing atmosphere extended into the non-collegiate arena. So mm-hmm. we're, we're really excited about that because in a lot of that, we'll, we'll use formats of this game or this function in that and partnerships. 
So one of the big things that we really rely on is a heavy reliance on partnerships with different companies that work with us to really not only just talk about the, the, the vendor things that they do, but also why it's important and, and really then start to use the gaming atmosphere, the experiential atmosphere to learn why doing this certain way of, of protecting your network is critical. So we, we do a lot of that. We work with the National Guard and others and um, we've provided some really, really interesting high level. Uh, another area that we, we are working with um, out of the Cyber Institute, which is really kind of cool, um, is an area where you don't think often that many people are looking at it, but it's the use of cyber, cyber technology to defeat human trafficking. Oh, wow. So this is an area uh, where we have a, an expert in the arena of human trafficking, um, and she provides classes utilizing technology, you know, how to know when someone's being human trafficked, how to recognize the signs of human trafficking and electronic spectrum, you know, all those kinds of things as forewarnings and training and cautions. And then also working with law enforcement, and other government agencies to figure out how to better track those who are doing it. Um, and again, we work with our partners to define new ways of looking at sources and means to try to find and track down those that are, you know, um, executing human trafficking. The awareness part of that is really the critical part, mm -hmm. how to get the word out that, you know, the stuff you put on your Facebook may come back to haunt you really bad one day. So um, that side of the house has been really um, um, an amazing emotional journey for our staff. And, and it's just quite rewarding to see it happen. That's a, that's a powerful, uh, it's a powerful thing to try and help and solve with technology that, uh, you know, I think people focus on the negative so much of what it does, but there are some, I mean, that's a great example of technology doing some good or being able to do some good. Absolutely. And you know what it, you know what it boils down to? It's really amazing. There's three attributes that we use in that whole educational experience to help them figure this stuff out. And it's digital awareness, right? I mean, the digital awareness is phenomenal. If, if somebody's sending you notes and they're trying to get to know you and you don't know who they are, think, right? I mean, just be aware of where you're at, what you're doing. Then there's this whole analytical side. When we work with them on the analytics, it's, it's about understanding how to use the cloud to help you figure all this stuff out. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just mountains, terabytes of data going on around you. How do you parse it out? Well, and then the yeah. cyber side, right? And just yep. protecting yourself. Protect, mm -hmm. locking down your accounts, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. It's absolutely crazy. But it's the same three attributes we just talked about on the other side right. of the coin. Right. Yeah. And then the, the different ways of, of applying those three is, uh, it, it's, it, seems, it seems pretty infinite at this point, just, just, just given our conversation in the last hour. Um, that is, it, that's amazing. It, it's kind of eye-opening because again, it's not it's not as simple as just understand those two things and off you go. Right, right, right. But what it is, it's as simple as it's 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 like using logic, right? When you understand the principles of mm -hmm. logic, you start applying it to a problem set. The problem gets easier, right? And that's what we're talking about. These competencies make the problem set easier. They make your mm -hmm. awareness more available. They they make a solution. They make the defense more available. So all it does is it opens another portal, another window for you to be able to be cognizant of what's going on around you and what's happening mm -hmm. to you. Um, you know, it's okay. I got to admit to it. Um, it's probably not funny, but you know, I, I had some, some guy was trying to social engineer me on, on Facebook the other day. And, mm -hmm. and I, I just, I played with him for two and a half hours. And it, at the end of it, when I got bored, I said, Hey dude, um, you know, you're not who you say you are. Here's why I know that. And I oh, know, by the way, here's your address. And I'd, I'd be worried about 5-0 if I were, you know what I mean? Just, it just yep. done. Yep. But that's how much I got social engineered out of them when they're trying to social engineer me. Right. Right. So, so again, it's not that I'm any expert. It's not that I'm smarter than them. It's just that I'm using those principles of awareness and cognizance and protecting myself. And there it was. Yeah. No, and it's it's like um it's like a like you tell a kid to look both ways before they cross the street, and this yeah. is that online. This is yeah, you know, I, I used to give this um, lecture to more um, elderly people about older older people, older generation who weren't as you know uh, uh, cyber digital aware. Sure. And I used to say, you know, I start off with the conversation. You know, they go, well, why is a password a password important? 
I said, okay, let me ask you a question. Do you have a house? Yes. Mm. Do you have locks in your doors and windows? Yes. Do you use them? You know, and sometimes you get the person that says no. And I said, give me your address. I'd like to come visit, you know, just moron. Um, But there are those who say, yeah, I use them. And your Mm. question is why? And they go, because I want to protect the valuables and, you know, my family inside the house. Okay. The window locks and the door locks are the same as your password. Mm -hmm. Protect the valuables in your computer. You know, it's, it's really simple. Um, The other thing I, I, I tell them is that, you know, computers, they're not like your best friend. So you tell your best friend a secret, right? Right. Right. And, and you say, look, don't, don't okay. tell anybody. And, and you have some friends that, you know, you told them that because you know, they're going to tell everybody mm-hmm. and you told them because you want everybody to know, because you don't want to tell them yourself, but by God, it'll get told. Right. Yeah. But then you got a friend um, and that friend is, is loyal and, and won't tell anybody. Right. So, you, you know, well, a computer has no discretion. Mm-hmm. You ask a computer a question. And it will tell you everything it knows about answering that question. Mm-hmm. So, so if you look at what the hacker's job is, the, the hacker is the person's role is to ask the question, the right question, mm. ask the computer, the right question to get all the answers back on you. So if, you know, I, look, I did this when I first got computers, I did an inventory of all my wealth and important data and documents. And I put it in a spreadsheet that I created, mm-hmm. you know, it was the coolest thing ever. Right. Uh, and I put all that information there and there was no password protect or anything. You just put it there. That's just what they want. You know, and if you ask the computer, where's Bill's bank account, it would tell you. Right. And, you know, I put all the data in it. It was all there. Mm. So, so again, whatever you tell the computer, it's going to tell anybody else who asks it the right question. Right. So it, it's really about protecting yourself and, this is what led to our, our conversation around really digital literacy. Mm-hmm. What we figured out was this is the same conversation as digital literacy is understanding what does digital mean in today's world? Mm-hmm. You know, um, we, we had a, a situation where somebody called us and said, uh, my uh, bank account was hacked and it's, it's your fault university. Mm-hmm. And I went, Whoa, dude, how, how is it our fault? And they said, because I use my university email and my university password. And I said, well, we didn't give it to anybody. And I started asking a couple of questions and found out this guy had been social engineered. Mm. Right. And, and he gave up all his information through social engineering. And so, uh, you, you know, again, the digital awareness was zero. Yeah. He got, he got an F for that day in class. Right. Mm-hmm. Because again, he just didn't think about that digital awareness, which again, each equals, you know, analytical and cloud cybersecurity, all those things add up together. Mm-hmm. Gosh, I think I've said those enough that I should have. A, a <laughs> you are on them. it though. You are on it. I do appreciate, I do appreciate that. Um, so just one last, uh, one last topic that I think is, is interesting and it's, it's on everyone's tongue. Uh, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, and things like yeah. that. How do you see that entering this, I mean, cybersecurity aspect and another aspect for people to start paying attention to? Because as far as a, an application in space, it seems like a pretty uh, easy transition. Like if you're going to have a space economy up there, the easiest transaction is going to yeah. be a digital currency. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, again, this one goes back to the digital literacy aspect. Mm. Um you know, there, there are different, there are multiple different ways to acquire access Bitcoin. Um, some controlled, some not controlled. And that's mm. the cool, sexy part of them is they're not controlled. <laughs> you know, it's this place in space. And if it's, if it's on your thumb drive, that's the only place it is. I would suggest it's much like being a consumer. When you start hanging information out there and you don't know where it is, you don't control it. Mm. It's not really yours, is it? So again, um, I think of things whenever it has to do with money. I think, I think more like a consumer it, it is, is my Bitcoin protected? Is there a way that I know that somebody's watching it right. or is somebody is at least has cognizance of the security architecture around it? You know, those kinds of things. Now, again, there are those who believe that the security is because it's only touched by me. I own it. You know, mm-hmm. I'm the only one that has access to it. And in many cases, that, that's absolutely the truth. You know, look at the guy that just lost, what, $58 million because he lost his thumb drive yeah. or his password to the thumb drive. 
So I guess it works, right? If you yeah. can throw that kind of money away. I guess the key becomes then, how do you move that around in space? Mm-hmm. And we're back to the digital and the cyber aspect of that conversation, right? right. So to me, um, yeah, we're, we're moving that direction. The, the world is moving that direction for different reasons. Mm-hmm. And I think that will be a medium by which space will have to move to. Although I see like, you know, what is it? Tesla backed off on using Bitcoin for buying their cars and such. But yep. I think, again, what they're, what they're learning is until we can validate the methodologies, the delivery, the security, the aware, all those things, we're not really going to take that risk. Once right. that risk comes down, like everything else, it's going to accelerate. Mm-hmm. No, I, I think that's I think that's great, and it's a topic that I'm I'm getting more involved into, and I'm I'm definitely trying to learn and kind of like uh, poke at whatever hypotheses I have on on the subject. So, yeah, so that, I, I appreciate you know, again, that. Look at the. It's really interesting to look at the different formats by which the the information is shared, delivered, executed. So you, mm-hmm. you really break it down to some really basic. Um, I always try to make it easy for people I'm dealing with. It's like going to the grocery store. Okay. Mm. You make a list before your grocery store, you go to the grocery store, you check off the list, you check your, your grocery cart to make sure you got the stuff in the bag, right? You buy it. You get home, you kind of look at it, but you really never look at it again. And then when you figure out, shit, I didn't get that one thing I needed, you mm. kind of bypass it, right? You go, oh, I go back and get it. Right. It's the same thing here. Mm. Y- y- you know, just don't go into it going, oh, man, I wonder what I'm going to buy today. Woo-hoo, what's low? You right, know? right. So really, you, you have an objective in mind. Your mm. objective also is, how am I going to control? You, you really mm. want to have that in mind before you get there, right? You, you really want to know, is this going to be only owned by me? You know, I'm going to put it on a thumb drive. I'm the only one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, again, what kind of trail are you living, leaving when you do Bitcoin mining? Mm. Right. Is it something that somebody else follows? Are they watching? Right. Are they monitoring? And again, we don't know. Right. Right. We don't know. <laughs> right. And in some cases, yes, they're watching you because you're looking at their product, making them more money when you do. Mm. Right. Um, there's a there's a a, a a Bitcoin that's out right now, a cyber coin that's out right now, where they offer you five hundred dollars for going through their viewing session and then you know buying your purchase with them, right? Mm. Or it's 50 or 500, I can't remember. But right. isn't that interesting? Because mm. they're automatically sucking you in to give them information yeah, and then paying you for it. Why are they paying you for it? Hmm. Well, just to do business? Interesting. No, probably not. Right? Yeah. Think about that. Yeah, think yeah. about that. You know, this yeah. is all, whoa. And again, yeah. I, if we get back to that, that consumer approach that, okay, I'm digitally aware now. I know what's going on. So I know whenever I go there, they're automatically collecting data on my IP, Mm-hmm. If I give them additional information, like who I am and my phone number and all this stuff, stuff now they got a whole lot more data on me than I really wanted them to have in the first place. Right. Right. And then I make a purchase and they say, don't worry, it's protected. Right. So now they've got my name, my address, my phone number, my credit card data or my bank account number, and it's protected. But I really don't know who they are. <laughs> I'm just going with the fact that, they're selling me some kind of Bitcoin or cyber coin. Right. 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 And, and who checked them out? You know, that, that was, right. that was that pregnant pause thing where you're going, Holy crap. I don't know. Oh no. The anxiety is, is rising over on this end. Yeah, really? <laughs> really? It's, it's a, it's a lot to handle. And I think it's makes sense why a lot of people have stayed away from it. Uh, not just the cryptocurrency and the other stuff, but even some other things online um, yeah. just because they, they may have some idea of how infinite the well is of the, the unknown of your security and what trail you're leaving. But then there's uh, yeah. a whole nother group of people that never consider it at all. Yeah, no, okay. So here, we're going to go back to the peak program conversation. So yeah. there's a whole generation of, of um, uh, older Americans who won't do banking online. Mm. Have you ever talked to one? Yeah. Yeah. All right. What do they, yes. what do they tell you why they won't? Because it opens a door on the other end to, yeah, to them to, to take it out. And they yep. don't trust it. And it's too easy, right? Mm-hmm. But we have a younger generation who has only done banking online. Mm-hmm. So now they're programmed mm-hmm. to trust the online process. Mm-hmm. And that's not good or bad. It's not a statement. It's just a no, statement. No, it just it is. Right. Program, right. right. And, and so, again, we go back to that other conversation that we had where you know, um, pre-programmed to answer the phone, pre-programmed to push the button to accept the email. Right. So there are negative attributes of being programmed in a certain way 
mm. that bad agents are looking to take advantage of. Right. And so mm. that's where we see where we fall victimized by a, by generational program. Right. And, and this is down. also, <laughs> this is also the, uh, the same idea of why a career in cybersecurity is going to be around for a very, as long as digital is going to be around right. because you got how, without any fault, just because what it is, our behaviors will change. And then the people trying to access that information and our new behaviors, they're going to change. And then the industry has to adapt to that strategy. Absolutely. Yeah. No, Absolutely. that's wild. So, now, as, so I found it really interesting. Um, so there are, there are companies who believe that security is after delivery of, of a market product. So I got to launch my product, I'll put it out there, and then we'll build a security component into it later. Because I don't have the money, it's a, it's a new start, it's a, you know, it's a first gen, all that sort of discussion. Mm -hmm. The other thing that a lot of companies like to do is obscure, uh, security through obscurity. So they have 16 pages of documentation uh, and, you know, a whole page that says we're very secure, we do our business this way, but they don't tell you anything about what that means. Mm. But because it's 16 pages long, you look at it and you go, they, these guys must really know what they're talking about because they got 16 pages of security profile, right? right? right. They're right. incredible. And all they've really done is scare you, but not done anything to secure it. Right. Right. So the security is through obscurity. In other words, we either pretend it or we put enough in there to protect ourselves mm. from you suing us. Right. Because right. you signed the document. You said on the piece of paper. But did you yep. really read those 16 pages? Have you oh, actually really read no. those 16 pages? No, no, we don't have, we don't have an idea what it says in there. Right. <laughs> so, so that's kind of an interesting, um, that's an interesting twist. Mm -hmm. So understanding how all that works. So again, um, that digital awareness, that cybersecurity awareness almost becomes more critical, you know, uh, even mm -hmm. in just operating systems, you know, what do you use? You use Android, you use uh, uh, iOS, you know, what do you use? All those questions actually become more relevant in the future than they ever were in the past. Hmm. Yeah, and, it, and again, how much trust you put in them. Right. And that right. doesn't mean we all have to be experts. That, that's the scary. Right. You know, I, and I talked, um, I gave a, a, a discussion lecture a couple of weeks ago to a small business association. Hmm. So the idea of the conversation was, really the bottom line of it was, become digitally aware of what you're doing, right? Yeah. right. Know what the heck you're doing. If you have, if you let people use mobile phones, you better understand what that means, right? right? But most important in all of that, what's the crown jewels you want to protect? What are the things that are most important to your company that if somebody else had in their hands, you'd go under, mm. right? That's where you start your protection. That's where you focus. Mm -hmm. And you should check those every morning when you wake up at lunch and before you go to bed at night. Yeah. Those are the things that you check. And mm. if you're not doing that today, you better get in the business of doing that because it's when you stop is when they go missing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Just focusing the right, asking the right question about yep. your life online and, and anything that you're dealing with. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. It, it, do you think it's, it's just advanced so quickly that we just have a lot of old behaviors or is it more complex than that? No, I, I, um, the pace of technological change has moved faster than a cultural change mm. and our ability to adapt and successfully consume those technologies. Right. Um, and so we're buying, we're getting more technology in front of us on a daily basis. We're thinking less and less and less about the effects of it from a security posture. Mm. It just become more accepting. Yeah. Right. Um, now, that's not necessarily a bad thing as much as at some point in time, you got to figure out what are the crown jewels? What are the most essential things that you do not want out on the network that you want protected? And how do you mm. protect it? Mm. And so, you know, I, I bet I bet you do a health exam on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. Why don't we do cyber exams or checkups on an annual basis? Right. It, it's right. all part of who we are nowadays. It's a, it's our, it is our DNA. Our DNA is out there in the cyber world. Yep. We should be checking our, our cyber DNA on an annual basis, if not really monthly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, and a small business should be checking it daily. Mm. 
Bill, you've, you've opened my mind up in this last hour and, and change. Uh, thank you so much for coming on today. And, and uh, well, it's a, take, it's take a, a lid problem. off. <laughs> yeah. The steamer blew up, you know, <laughs> over, over he, I can see the steam coming out of your ears now. It's just, it's a horrible thing, but you know, it, no, uh, but it's, it's all good. It's, it's for, I feel like it's for the good. Um, do you have any last, last words for the folks at home uh, listening? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are those who have been had by cyber effects and those who will be um, don't give up. Mm. The, the, you know, most people panic and, and go into uh, flight mode all automatically when they're, they're under pressure from a cyber event. Um, I would argue it's the time that you take a breath, step away and then look at what's going on and start documenting the crap out of it. Mm. Write it down, weird stuff, stuff you didn't know, all that sort of stuff. And then just start going through that list and figuring out what's really happening mm. and get control, yeah. right? D don't panic. Don't panic. Um, right. the, the panic is, you know, it's the classic situation. Oh, I thought I was being hacked. So I turned off my computer. Everything's fine now. No, you just let it embed into your system is all you're really had now. Cause the next yeah. time you turn it on, they'll already be there. You know, yeah. it, it's that kind of stuff. So it's really mm. about slowing down thinking, uh, working your way through it. Um, and uh, I, I challenge everyone to start thinking in, in those three competencies of digital awareness, cloud, and uh, cyber. And uh, you'll see things starting to change around you that you didn't ever think would change. Well, thank you, Bill. It's been an honor. Um, I definitely look forward to catching up after the the event goes international and, yep. and hearing about that and and, and how that goes. Um, where, where can folks, uh, find you online to, to maybe reach out or maybe the, um, yeah, that, um either at, at, at Cal Poly, uh, we're online, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, um, we're online as well as the Cy California Cybersecurity Institute online. Uh, if you type that in, you'll find us. Awesome. Again, thank you, Bill, for, for coming on and sharing your, your wealth of knowledge of this and, and for, for helping to get this next generation of an enabling access to to cyber for for not the experts <laughs> absolutely i appreciate we'll, it we'll get you an invite to the event you can turn into our switch channel and just be be flabbergasted man i i'd love that i'm looking forward to it <laughs> awesome well thank you again and everybody spread love and spread science live long and prosper and be well see you next time <laughs>